part of we are a part of the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Every county in Arizona has a Cooperative Extension office. You may be familiar with some of our other programs such as 4-H, food safety, nutrition education, STEM and commercial horticulture and small acreage support. Master Gardeners prov provide science-based horticulture information and tonight's presentation is on garden pests and integrated pest management. Our presenter tonight is well known to most of us, Lauren Paz. Lauren became a master gardener in 2019 and has served on the Speakers Bureau for over two years. She is an avid backyard gardener, applying what she learns in the course of teaching to all aspects of caring for her yard and that of her community. Her passion is to educate people on a wide variety of garden, gardening topics, including native wildlife that frequent our gardens. Normally, I say I'm really excited. I happen to be one, if you've heard me before, that says, I don't put anything on my garden. So it'll be interesting to see if she will handle any of our natural stuff for people like me. But I know it's an excellent science-based presentation. So Lauren, take it away. Thank you, Tricia. And I'm excited to present this, especially because this week I've been dealing with a multitude of pests in my garden. So as we talk through this, we will share some of our stories. Tonight, we're going to cover the principles of integrated pest management, um, our prevention techniques, our pest control methods, um, both physical, biological, chemical, and of course, organic. And we're going to identify some of our common pest insects, what they like to eat and how to deal with them. And of course, pests are not just insects, they could be our small animals and wildlife. So I'm going to read this because I think it's really important. Integrated pest management, which we will refer to as we go along as IPM, is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of technical techniques such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and use of resistant varieties, and that would be our plants. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed according to established guidelines and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the targeted organism. Pest control materials should be selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, beneficial and non-targeted organisms and the environment. That's a mouthful, but it'll all make sense when we're done with this. So the principles of IPM, I call it an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You need to identify the pest species that you're, you're targeting. You have to determine what your damage threshold is. A few holes in your leaves does not mean that your plants are damaged nor your fruit. You're gonna employ preventive measure, measures. You're gonna employ control options. And then we're gonna monitor. And after we monitor, we may choose to do other things. So an IPM pesticides is, besides means kill. Um, we are gonna use pesticides when non-chemical management methods fail to control a significant pest problem. When situations warrant pest use, well, control methods also should, should include should include non-chemical strategies. And pest eradication is impossible, but pest management is feasible. So as I said earlier, pesticides um, means kill, and pesticides kills any substance of any pest, including anthropoids, vertebrates, and plants. And interesting enough, as I, as I prepared this, um, we have what I would call a side in our house all the time. We have cockroach sprays and baits. We use insect repellents for our personal use on our bodies. We have uh, rat and rodent pet poisons. 
flea and tick sprays on our pet and pet collars on our pets. Our household disinfectants and sanitizers have sides in them. Um, we have products that kill mold and mildew. And our lawn products have, such as weed killers, have sides in them. So we are actually exposed every day in our daily life to something that means kill. So pesticides, there's both the home and the professional use. For general use, it's the box store. It's what you, you see a pest, you go to one of our, our local stores and you look for something to help you eradicate that pest. They're not, they are likely not to harm the environment when used according to the label. And we'll get into reading the label. And anyone in the public can use a general pesticide. Now, restricted use of pesticides is governed by EPA. And they can, and that's because they are very strong and can cause harm to both human health and the environment when they're not used accordingly. And when you use restricted use pesticides, you must be trained and testing is required to purchase and apply these pesticides. So you're using a certified applicator. I live in an HOA and we have uh, somebody who comes through regularly to spray and it's, it's uh, required by law that they have to you have to have their fact sheet with them at all times. I've challenged them and they provided it. But in our local area, if the winds are over 15 miles an hour, they are not allowed to spray um, any pesticides in the area. So these are actually a couple pictures I'm gonna show you of items that I had have in my um, area of use for disease prevention. And as I, uh, when I bought these, I never was as knowledgeable as I am today of what I was purchasing. So when you buy anything from the store, you're gonna have three different labels. The first one is danger. And now it doesn't have a little four, four uh, square area in it, but you can see on this one, it's from Ortho. It's for a rose spray. Um, danger means it's the high, highest level of danger to you and what you could be using. And if you just look at this, it's corrosive to your eyes, um, harmful on the skin. It says you should wear goggles and face shields. And it has a number if you get exposed, who to call to get immediate attention. These are items that um, should not be used in a day-by-day -day use. I have this, and right now I am trying to figure out how to get rid of it because it is a hazardous waste. Another one that you might see is warning, which could be a variety of next level down from danger, but um, also very toxic. I don't have an example of that, but caution is as simple as what we all think is normal Gardening is neem oil, insecticidal soaps, um, seven dust. And this label, as I took a picture of, says caution, and that is seven dust. And it's harmful if swallowed, um, called poison control. So you can even see the lowest level of caution has um, a lot of issues that we should be aware of. So when we apply any pesticides. There are three different methods of doing it generally. Um, a proportioner, which is a hose and sprayer. And I look at this as you go to you go to Home Depot, you buy the Miracle Grow, it has fertilizer in it, and you're spraying an abundance of items. And this is what a proportioner is. And this is not recommended for most situations because now you're not targeting the plant that you're trying to er eradicate pests from, but you're providing a wide array of spray and, and not controlled substance. So a compressed air sprayer, as you can see here, is very targeted and is the best for a backyard gardener. You have the solution in your, your bottle and you're pointing it exactly to what you're looking at to eradicate. In the olden days and still today, we have the hand duster, which is a very old fashioned, not necessarily accurate, 
projector and you have um, basically a dust fume, and it could be seven dust in this case, and you're just pumping it and, sp and spraying a dust over a wide range of area, but much smaller than a proportional. One of the other things to think about is when you're spraying, and as we just saw, even the most lowest level, um, what I would even say organic means of, of pest control, it is still having cautionary uh, flags on it. It is recommended that we wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, um, boots, not sandals so that you're not having your skin exposed. Remember, skin is an organ and skin can absorb any chemical that it is in contact with. Definitely, you wanna think about wearing hat and gloves. You don't want your hair to be contaminated and certainly your hands, which is most likely when you're using some form of a sprayer or, or implementer. Many of your laborers will say eye and face protection and as I was looking at the store, the eye protection was the most prevalent in all of the chemicals that was on the counter. Respirator, I would say that's in the danger zone. And again, that would be as recommended per your label. And then at a top level, the disposable protective clothing such as Tyvek over your current clothing. And that would be disposable as soon as you were done. Now, what do you do after you finish spraying? Well, now you have to worry about cleaning your clothes. Um, once you are done during the day of spraying or treating your plants or your pests, you need to change your clothes and because they have now become contaminated. You want, if you're not gonna wash them immediately, you wanna store them in a plastic bag until they can be washed. You want to make sure that you're washing them with the maximum amount of detergent. You probably will want to pre-soak them because you want to get any contaminants out before you put them in the washing machine. But still, after you do wash your clothes, run the washer one time through so there's no chemicals left that can now contaminate your regular clothes. And they recommend that your clothes um, you hang them outside and not put them in the dryer. And why do you do this? It's because when you read the labels, many of your chemicals are flammable. And you certainly don't want to put something in your dryer that has not been completely cleaned and set your, fire, your dryer on fire. So now that we got the practices underway or are understood as far as how we're going to be so careful in using these chemicals, we are gonna start with prevention techniques. And this is so that we don't have to use the chemicals on our plants. The first thing is you're gonna keep your plants healthy because the healthier plants are less likely to incur diseases and pests. We're also gonna practice good sanitation. And that could include cleaning up dead leaves. Um, you're gonna keep weeds out of your area because they can encourage um, bugs you're gonna possibly grow disease resistant varieties. And these are available more at specialty stores than your box stores. Crop rotation and companion planting are extremely important. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that at a later time. You wanna also encourage beneficial insects. And I wanna remind you that not all bugs are bad. So if you have, for instance, aphids on your roses, um, and you also see white flies near, or uh, not white flies, but um, lacewing bugs. Those are ones who are gonna eat your aphids. So you, if you spray your aphids, you may also be killing your, your beneficial bugs. Check your plants regularly for insect damage. I at least go out every other day and inspect my plants because in two days you could get a lot of damage. And you also, a lot of people think that the damage to their plants could are from pests like bugs, but it could be from other problems such as overwatering, other sources that come in, and you wanna make sure that you're not treating a problem that doesn't exist. So the first method of control is your physical controls. 
And that includes your hand picking of a bug off, um, strong stream of water, such as if you have white flies, clippers, which can clip a, a severe problem area off. But remember, when you're using the clippers, clipping something with bugs on it, you want to immediately contain it in a plastic bag so it doesn't spread. And you want to make sure that when you put it in your trash can, it doesn't spread from that point. Floating row covers is important or covers around certain plants. Plant colors, cover collars, shiny objects if you have birds that are impacting your um, produce and chicken wire cages. And this is an example of what I use. Um, I back up into a large open area that has a stream behind it. So I get every pest you can imagine. So I have a PVC pipe system with chicken wire around it. It's about an eight foot by three and a three foot section, easy to pick off. I may have bugs that come in, but I certainly don't have rodents and uh, squirrels that could eat my, my vegetables. Here's a few other examples. We have the pest strips that can go into plant areas. Um, for instance, like whitefly, we have traps. Um, in the center down below, we have hot pepper. A lot of people swear by uh, even their homemade concoction of a hot pepper sauce spraying on it. It's not damaging to the plants, but certainly it detracts pests and animals from eating your leaves. Um, and then we talked about floating roll covers, but there's also plant covers. Um, a simple lightweight uh, frost cloth which allows uh, UV light to come through, will protect especially from grasshoppers and, and bugs that are uh, frequently moving from one plant to another. So besides the physical control methods, if they don't work, you have your biological controls. And we talked about our beneficial insects, lady beetles, which we love to call lady bugs, your lacewing hover flight ground beetles, and, um, there's also the uh, minute uh, beetle that will be scavengers for those, those bugs that you have in your yard. Now, if you like, if you're thinking of going out and buying a case of, or a container of ladybugs to put in your yard, I've had a lot of people say, but they disappeared in a couple days. Well, that means you don't have enough insects in your area to feed the ladybugs. So they're gonna move elsewhere. They are only gonna, your beneficial insects are only going to be there when you have something that they want to eat. We also have BT, Bacillus thuringius, and that is a natural element that can be in the soil, but it also is something that you can buy in a, in a nursery store that will you can spray on or put in your soil. That is a natural ingredient to fight, fighting certain types of pests. And BT can come in a multitude of forms depending on what best pest you have. So you have to be sure when you buy it, you're buying the right ingredient for the pest you have back to identifying what your problem is. Now, companion planting is an interesting one that I've presented on before. Um, there are many pests, bugs that do not like certain smells as well as, as rodents and other um, small animals. Onions and leeks and garlics are one of them. And when you companion plant, you're putting a plant near something. And let's take, for example, a rose bush, which aphids love. If you plant garlic and or onions next to it, it will, will keep the aphids away because they do not like the smell of, of the onions. Um, not all plants work well with others. So if you have a certain plant you're having a problem with, just Google companion planting with the plant that you're having an issue with. It'll tell you what plants to plant. I also found that marigolds was an excellent source of uh, companion planting for many of my crops. And crop rotation is important. And we always talk about crop rotation in terms of regenerating the soil. However, many bugs go into the, into the ground for hibernation and they wait for the next spring to come out and, and feed on the same plant. 
Well, if you rotate your crop and that, that pest is not interested in the new crop, they will not have anything to feed on and may disappear. So crop rotation is not only good for your soil regeneration, but it is also good for keeping certain pests off your plants. And lastly, you know, if we can't control between the physical and biological, we have chemical. And chemical can go two ways. It's both the hardcore chemicals and it is organic. And my screen is not moving. There we go. So your organic method, which is also chemical, and we also saw that neem oil had a caution label on it, um, but it is, least, it is least toxic to the food that you're growing. Um, that can, can include neem oil, insecticidal soap, and iron, iron phosphate granules, which would be great for your slugs. Um, insecticidal soap is interesting. It, it works by directly, the liquid part of it, directly contacting with the pest. So if you spray insecticidal soap and it dries, it won't do any good if the pests come on at a later time. So now we go deeper in. Pesticide is a global, it includes all sorts of pest control, both fungus, um, different vertebrates, uh, spiders, let's say. Insecticides specifically kill in certain types of insects. And your insecticides, when you're looking at them, it includes poisoning, uh, stomach poisonings, contact, systemic, um, and growth regulators so that they, the legs that they, ate, they lay are dormant, and desiccants. And desiccants would be uh, is a drying agent. So it basically, as they digest it, it dries them up and eventually kills them. So all of these insecticides can kill all sorts of common pests. But the most important issue here is that you identify the pest you have because not all of them will work on each type of pest. And then also we have fungicides. And again, remember side is to mean kill. So we're killing fungi. And fungi is probably the most difficult thing to control. Cultural practices are usually key, such as sanitation and irrigation. We have examples on the, on the right-hand side of fungi in the grass and fungi on a tree. And they're only effective typically prior to infecting. So you wanna keep, create a barrier to the infection as much as trying to treat it. In the cases that you see on, in the pictures here, it's, it's pretty much out of control and then they may lose those portions of, of infected area, tearing them out and replacing them eventually. So our major points of this part, not all organisms that damage plants need to be controlled. Um, we have many beneficial insects that we have to balance between damage from the bad insects to the to killing the insects that are trying to help you in your garden. You also have to identify what thresholds you are willing to live with when you be, before you begin your pesticide application. A few holes in the leaves of your zucchini plant doesn't mean that your zucchini is gonna be infected. Um, we are gar backyard gardeners and not selling in a grocery store. So perfection is not necessarily what we need. We just wanna make sure that the fruit that we are growing is, is productive and edible. The other thing is before you can apply any treatment, you really know what, need to know what your pest is. There are so many varieties of treatments on the market that if you're just going to the store to buy a pest control method, it may be totally ineffective and you're left with a hazardous waste in your garage. You always need to read the label before buying, before mixing, before applicating, and, and after cleanup. There are so many labels that say do not apply if the fruit is established on your tree, on your bush, or your 
or your tree. So sometimes pesticides can only be used at the beginning of the growing season. Make sure you also buy pesticides in the appropriate size containers. Um, they do go bad after a period of time. They are hazardous waste and you need to find out, figure out when you buy this and are done using it, how are you gonna dispose of it? We've had people in our community who thought, well, I'll just spray it out or dump it down the, um, the drain. Well, the majority of our pesticides are contaminants to our water system and will kill all the uh, fish and native life in our water system. And most pesticides are considered hazardous waste and need to be disposed of accordingly. I did look up Prescott Valley and Prescott to see how to dispose of hazardous waste. I believe that Prescott has once a year, um, uh, once a year, a time where you can dispose of hazardous waste, Prescott Valley. I have not seen any time where they have given you the option to dispose of hazardous waste. And typically, when you do have hazardous waste, you need to have a driver's license that shows that you live in the area. So this could be an issue as you're buying chemicals. So that's all the things you have to think about how to treat the pests. Now we're going to talk about the pests we have in our yards. So we got, we got our pictures and we've got what they eat and why they're there. And I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. And the aphids is the first on the list. There are a variety of aphids. This picture is of the green aphids. Um, they like cabbage, and, um, although we also know that aphids love ro roses and a variety of new type birth. They love tender leaves. Their population does decline with heat and predators and as predators come in to eat them. Um, once I see a lace wing or a ladybug in my area, I know I have aphids and I'm looking for them. Um, to know that you have aphids, you'll, if you don't see them directly, you'll have a honeydew or sort of a sticky, shiny, sticky substance on your plant. You may have ants. Ants love the honeydew. And eventually it'll turn into a black sooty mold. Um, the controls are your the first off, you will have lace wings, ladybugs, um, and virid flies abundant in your area if you have a lot of aphids. You can also use a high pressure hose, and this will also work for white flies, as we'll talk about. Now, remembering a high pressure hose, if you have a delicate bud, may destroy the bud as much as it's destroying the aphids. Um, insecticidal soap works, but the soap has to touch, the liquid part of the soap has to touch the insect. And many of the, of the um, aphids will live underneath the, the leaves. So you'll have to figure out how to get that soap under all the leaves because you may not see them on top, but you'll see the residual of that they were there. And then, then there's a variety of home rem remedies. Most of them include a soap-based uh, remedy. And those sometimes work and they sometimes don't, don't, but they have to be physically in top contact with the, with the aphid. And if it dries off, it's no longer working. Aphids can attack cabbage collar, and we're talking mostly gardening, not, not um, ornamental plants, but turnips, mustard, broccoli, sun, sun, uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, radishes, and, and I added rosebuds because that seems to be where my aphids are. We also have beetles. And in this example, um, there are so many types of beetles that we could be here all night discussing them. So I added the bluster beetle. Um, the beetles like everything in your garden. Um, eggplant, tomatoes, and potatoes are all part of a similar family. So if you have one, you may have them on all of them. Um, squash and, and the um, cucumbers, et cetera, are all, again, part of the same family. And these bugs will show up 
after watering in the morning, um, I typically use a tweezers and go in there and try to pick them off. Um, I don't, I will spray the leaves. I won't spray any uh, fruit or, or product coming out. They have no natural enemies. Um, the only good thing about them is they do eat grasshopper eggs if they're around. Generally, the only cultural control you can have is your physical barrier of such a row cover or a plant cover. And you're looking at chemical control being probably in the uh, danger to caution area being carbaryl, melathion, and stomach poisonings. Um, once you get infested with beetles, it is difficult to get rid of them. This is one area where they will lay eggs in the ground. So crop rotation would be very important from one season to the next to move your crops and, and make sure that you're not planting a crop that they like in the same location. The flea beetle. Now I have to say all of these pictures are magnified. So it looks like you'd be readily able to see a flea beetle. These are tiny, tiny little black specks on your plant leaves. Mostly they affect your eggplant, your tomato, and your potato plants. Their natural enemies are parasitic wasps. Um, I don't like wasps in my area because they do attack. So I have an imbalance if I have that. Your cultural control is weeds because flea beetles do love to hibernate and land in your weeds. Row covers can work, but I want to remind you if you put uh, row covers on your plants or covers just on your plants, you have to make sure that the, the insect is not contained within because they will have a field day because they won't have any competition. Chemical control is again your uh, malathion, acephate, and carbaryl. And then we have the grasshopper. I have had zero luck in controlling the grasshopper. They are free to go where they want to go, when they want to go. Um, they're not steady on one particular plant. They only have one natural enemy, which is poultry. Um, in our city limits, we, have, uh, we typically don't have poultry in that area, only if you have a larger spread. Your culture control is interesting. If you maintain green borders away from your garden, they will more likely come to that first um, and eat that before they come and eat the plants inside your area. And physical barriers would be, of course, your floating row floating covers. Um, I did read that garlic sprays um, in many places are probably the most um, beneficial use of organic means of, of spraying an area that they may want to go on. It doesn't harm any of your plants. And seven baits, the seven type um, materials which you can create baits would also help kill them. And I included this one picture showing you how a grasshopper lays its eggs. I thought that was pretty interesting. And then we have leaf hopper, hoppers. There's a variety of leaf, leaf hoppers and I included in this photo, the beet leaf hopper. It looks at your tomatoes, beets, pepper squash, bean squash, bean squash, melons, cucumbers, spinach, and potatoes. Um, it causes severe amount of damage after planting, um, at, at plant after the end of June to avoid these, they are more spring type, um, insects. You need to manage your weeds. Again, they will be attracted by our native weeds. You protect your young plants with the row covers. They do like to eat more on your younger growth than older. And in this picture, which I'm sorry is not that great because I had to expand it, but if you see a significant amount of damage from uh, a leafhopper eating your uh, foliage, the best thing to do is remove it and, and not let it spread. And when you do remove um, any foliage or flowers or anything that are infected, the best thing to do is put a plastic bag over it before you cut it. 
contain the insects that are that are uh, infecting your crops so they don't just immediately spread to another plant. The, and the beef, beet leaf hopper will suck the undersides of leaves, which make the top look sort of mottled. It can also transmit the curly top disease. So if you see your leaves pucker or stunted, um, and the leaves for tomato plants, for instance, curl upwards, um, and the main stems of your, between your leaves and the stem um, are pointed down and the leaves turn leathery or yellow is a good indication that you have leaf hoppers. And there are so many variety of leaf hoppers. This is just one example. They have about the same body formation, but may have different coloring. And then we have slugs. Um, I have a very large strawberry bed and slugs are probably my number one problem in that area next to the grasshoppers. They are attracted obviously to moist soil. So if you have a bed that's very leafy and moist underneath, you're more likely to find slugs. They only feed at temperatures over 50 degrees, which means during the winter they are dormant. The only natural enemy they have is birds. Um, but if you do protect your plants from birds, you're protecting the slugs from their natural enemy. In the case of slugs, handpicking, um, trap boards, beer traps, and, and marigolds are all options. Slugs love yeast. And so that's why beer traps work quite well. And a beer trap would be taking a small container, putting it, burying it in the ground so it's the top is at ground level putting some beer in it. And then at night, the slugs would go look for the yeast and you would, you would be able to pull them out. And trap boards are about the same thing. You can put some yeast on the trap boards and, on, and it's, you put the boards on the ground with the yeast below it and the slugs will go under the boards. You pick it up in, in the morning and you can hand pick the, uh, the slugs out. Your chemical control is a pretty easy one. It's iron phosphate granules, which is a more organic solution. But remember that it does not kill the eggs, only the slugs as they eat it. So you're gonna to have to continue to repeat that treatment. And then we have spider mites. Again, I'm looking at this as a vegetable garden, which is they like melons and raspberries, eggplants and beans. Um, but spider mites are very prevalent on junipers and some of our um, pines. So if you see a, a web type situation, you're gonna know that you have a mite. Their natural enemies and uh, enemies are your thripes and minute pirate bugs, lacewings, bug-eyed uh, bugs and lady beetles. Um, what I do, I have four junipers in my yard. Once a week, I go out and I do a heavy spray on all the branches just to avoid the dust buildup because that's what the uh, mites work with in terms of building their, uh, their webs. And the chemical controls are as easy as your soaps and oils, your miticides in extreme cases. And you can see the signs of the mite by the webbing white or yellow specks on your leaves, and if the leaf population drops in high amounts. Um, you see the mite on the side here. Mites are so small, you will never see them. You only see the remains of what they did and their webbing. And we have thripes. Um, they like, of, of all things, they like garlic, onion, and so you can't use those as a companion plant in areas that you don't want thripes. Um, they like squash and cucumbers and beans. They're minute. Um, you can see at the picture at the left, they're, they're just tiny little dots, sort of as the same as a white fly, but they don't fly, they don't fly as much. They have your symptoms that you have them are edges of your leaves are curled, discolored and distorted and black specks of extra, extra mint are just typically found around your leaf surfaces. 
they too um, have natural enemies of your lady beetle, your predaceous mites, um, and your minute pirate bugs. So the control methods here is remove all the old flowers. They do lay their eggs in the flowers of a plant. Um, you want to control your weeds. You can always use your high pressure hose, row covers. Reflective mulch, and I could not find much on what that reflective mulch did. But then that's also said, be patient because as you do this, they lay so many eggs. It's such a repetitive process. And neem and systemic such as ortho and merit are, are good. And the ortho and merit are only recommended on your non-edible crops. And remember, as you were talking about using pesticides, Many of them say, do not apply if your fruit has already developed. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a tomato hornworm, but it looks exactly like this picture. Um, they can get pretty big. They come from our sphinx moths that only are alive for a, a two to three week period, but they do deposit the eggs, um, not necessarily on the tomato plant, but nearby, and they, um, they can devour a tomato plant within two to three days. So if you're, you have tomatoes, look at the leaves and see if any seam of stress that a leaf, leaves are disappearing. These tomato uh, hornworms can blend really easily into your tomato plants. They hang onto the leaves or to the branches, and you have to look extremely carefully branch by branch to find them. And the simplest way to remove them is hand picking them. They're not minute. Um, the, the tiny ones that are just um, coming out of their lava could be eaten by your lady beetles and lacewings, but most of them, by the time you see them, they're of substantial size. And they do say that tilling your soil um, after your harvest can, can result in up to 90% mortality of the, of the tomato hornworm coming back the next year. But just remember, they can, they can destroy a tomato plant within a week. And then we have white flies. Um, that to me is my nemesis right now. I have a whole bed of uh, greens, um, different types of lettuces. I just found them this week. I am continuing to spray, um, but they appear quickly. And if you don't keep track of them, they can also infest so fast that you'll have to take your entire crop out. They, it says they like tomatoes, eggplants, and cabbage. I've never seen them on, my, on those plants, but I certainly do see them on the roses, ornamental flowers, and my lettuce and spinach patches. They do like new growth, so that's where you're gonna to wanna to look. Their natural enemies are lacewings and lady beetles. They, um, I end up every morning right now spraying with a high pressure hose, and that seems to help me control it. Um, planting onions and leeks and garlics is beneficial. And insecticidal soap seems to me to be the easiest way to control it in a an organic method. And that's it for the generic pests in our garden. And now we're gonna to go to the other pests and they include all those little small animals and wildlife. And, you know, we have shrews, we have mice, we have rats, squirrels, um, in some places, gophers and rabbits and, and birds. And these wildlife have a whole different mechanism of control. But by using integrated pest management, we still are following the same thing. We have to correctly identify our pest. We have to employ our prevention options. We have to select a population control stat strategy and monitor. And I have three pictures down below. So if you have a rat or mouse, what are they after? Do you feed your dog outside if there's dog food? It's a perfect place for rats to come and feed. And our control method is a trap. Now, one of the things to think about in Arizona, 
most of our wildlife is protected. Um, some are not, and these include the wood rats or pat rats, Nor Norway rats, house mice, ground squirrels, pocket gopher gophers, rock doves, which we call pigeons, starlings, and English sparrows. Um, all of these are up for grabs. You can do anything to rid your yard without any penalties of breaking the law. Anything that's not on this list is protected. Um, so let's say javelinas and or rabbits. Those are protected from you injuring and um, destroying that particular wildlife. You can trap it and move it to a different area, but you cannot kill it. So one of the things to think about for your prevention measures is remove anything that's food, shelter, or access to your yard. Now, in my situation, access is a free open area. I can't do anything about it. We do put traps in certain places. And just so you know, for instance, uh, pack rats, they love to live in your air conditioner systems over the winter and they will eat your copper wires and destroy the insides of your uh, air conditioning system. So we put um, rat traps on, on either sides of our air conditioner units. And in the spring and the fall, we, we trap no less than three to four rats or mice per week. Um, exclusion is another area thing. And so in this picture, you see uh, firewood stacked up. Well, firewood is a perfect place for your small rodents to have shelter and find areas of seclusion. Another thing is frightening, frightening things such as sight or sound. Um, I see a lot of people put up the plastic owls thinking that the uh, rodents will see the plastic owl sitting there and leave the area. Well, rodents are smarter than you think. And if the owl doesn't move within weeks, they will know that there's no danger. So unless this, the item that you're trying to frighten them with either moves or makes a sound, it won't work. And the other is your repellents. And we always talk about odor, touch, and taste and touch. And that can include, what are you planting? Um, the deer used to eat all my plants out in the front yard. I put rosemary in, nobody touches my plants because they don't like the smell or the taste. Touch is if it's pokey or sticky, most animals don't like it. And so you really have to play around with native plants that will suit your, your area and help you prevent animals from coming in. And lastly, Prevention is a very long-term goal. Control is a very short-term goal. So prevention is what are you planting? How are you managing your surroundings? How are you getting rid of areas that your um, wildlife likes to live in to keep them out of your, of your growing area? Other prevention measures are your repellents, back to where your odor, taste, and touch. And I have a couple of um, samples here of just things to think about. Um, I have a lot of friends who use your cayenne pepper and Tabasco sauce. They mix it with water and spray it on their plants. It's not harmful to their plants, but certainly insects and or wildlife don't like the taste of it and they won't eat it. Um, I've never used mothballs but I hear that people put mothballs around the area of their plants because of the smell. The same with ammonia, uh, soaking, say, uh, strips of cloth in ammonia and laying it out. But remembering um, a lot of this, if you do anything but a drip, drip system, it, the um, ammonia and mothballs will disintegrate after a period of time. So think about the odor, touch, and taste. Um, as you're working your garden. And finally, all repellents will work some of the time, but no repellents will work all of the time. And part of that is during the monsoons when there's so much rain, these repellents won't work. And now we have the type of pests that we're dealing with. 
Now the rock squirrels, this, this guy is my nemesis. Um, we've been fighting um, rock squirrels. We back up into hiking trails um, with the city uh, or the town of Prescott Valley. And there's nothing we can do to avoid squirrels and, and uh, rabbits. But the squirrels are very damaging. They will do everything from digging up your plants. Um, they're very aggressive. So the only way to, to solve your problem if you have a squirrel is to actually get rid of it. Um, you can do fumigants, trappings, toxicants. Um, you can go as far as trying to eliminate brush in the surrounding areas, but they can travel a pretty good distance to get to your habitat. Um, and flood ir irrigation. And I have a lower picture, which is a, is a homemade method of trapping a uh, squirrel. And it's a four inch PVC pipe. It's long at the end with a post at the, at the center, which you can drop food in. And you have to have some means for the squirrel to get into the pipe, but it has to be this angle high enough that they can't get out of. But once you trap them, you have this contraption you now have to take and move someplace to get rid of the squirrel, unless you're putting dead bait to, that will kill it inside. Um, we have tried the cages with traps in it. Uh, squirrels are pretty um, savvy and they can find every way to get in, get food and not get trapped. So um, if anybody has a good suggestion for getting rid of squirrels, Besides a shotgun, I'd love to hear it. And we have our rats and they're everything from the pack rats to the wood rats. They're probably prevalent in all of our yards. Um, they can destroy our structures. If you have holes in your, or any access into your home, they can get into your home as well. So trying to find a way to exclude them from your yard is extremely important. Um, I've had more luck trapping the wood rats and pack rats in the squirrel cages, and I have the squirrels. Um, if you do trap a squirrel, um, you want to take it 10 miles from your house because anything from 10 miles in, they can find their way back. Rats are typically five miles away. Um, you can use anticoagulants, but if you do have fine dens um, where the pack rats live, just destroy them and they will make nests out of all sorts of materials around your property. And then we have our bunnies. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with the rabbits in our neighborhood, but I also found that if I feed them what they like, they leave my plants alone. If you are going to exclude, you want to have, and you're using chicken wire, make sure it's two feet above ground level and approximately one foot below because they can dig and they can dig deep to get to what they want. You also can use resistant plants and plants that are, um, again, I would say like rosemary, things that smell. Um, the rabbits don't touch my autumn sage and my native plants. Um, they go after more of the succulents uh, or the plants that I would say are, um, are uh, the greens. They don't touch by herbs because they have a smell. Um, and again, you need to look at what their habitat is. Rabbits like to burrow. So if you see a burrow in your dirt area, your soil area where you're growing plants, it may mean they're trying to nest and hibernate. And finally, we have javelina. And I'm not gonna spend too much time because javelina are more of your open area remote. But if you have javelina in your area, you need, and you're trying to protect, they can get through wood. They are very aggressive. Um, you'd want to have a metal fencing around an area to at least three feet high to protect your growth. Um, whatever it is that they, they love squash, they love pumpkins, zucchinis. So you want to keep that area protected. And you might even want to go as much as an electric fence. So we came from California and our first year here, I put a beautiful array of pumpkins and squash up my front area as for Halloween. Three days later, I came and the whole thing was totally destroyed. And somebody said, we have javelina in the area. What are you doing? You shouldn't be feeding these animals. So 
I think the other thing we, we see here is we have a lot of people coming from out of the area that have never been associated with Cavalina and don't know the rules to mitigate their, them coming into a general community. So that's all I have on integrated pest management. So if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Hey there, sorry. That's I was, okay. I'm I like, was, hello. I was deep in the the questions and answers, which we just have running comments going in the comment screen. That was an excellent presentation. Even Thank you, Tricia. I enjoyed it. I learned some things. Um, does anybody have any questions? We've had lots of good chatter. I hope you guys have been all watching it out there. Um, I did just put in the chat, I'm getting ready to put in the chat, um, information for our next presentation. Uh, it's going to be June 28th at 6.30. Um, it will be on growing sweet potatoes, potatoes, Jerusalem artichokes, and garlic, all of which I have in my yard, so I'm especially interested. And Kathy Watts is going to present it. So it's going to be phenomenal. Um, still waiting to see if we have anything else. Um, I love a comment. Enjoyed it, but it also reminded me how pesky all those insects and critters yeah. are. <laughs> and, and I also want to remind everybody that one of the major benefits that the um, Master Yavapai Master Gardeners Association does is provide um, a resource to home gardeners to identify pests and both on uh, or for leaf disease and or pest control. And we can either with a good picture uh, answer questions online, but if you have something you wanna bring into the office, bag it. We certainly don't want you to bring a live pest into the office, which could possibly infect something else. Um, but it's a great resource for identifying what it is and what to do about it. And you can take those to either our Prescott location or our Camp Verde location. Correct. Well, I don't see any questions, Lauren. Thank you so much for Wonderful. the Wonderful. It was awesome. <laughs> Tricia, I think there is a question in here about um, squash bugs. Oh, and, I do and, see um, one. And copper, and copper tape on slugs. I missed those. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, does copper tape stop slugs? I don't know that answer. Does anybody else? I've not heard of that solution, and I did not read about it when I was researching this. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen it advertised. The, the most, the, what I read most about slugs is they love yeast. And so any of the yeast type products um, that you can buy um, and or simple beer, but don't use your best beer <laughs> um, is, is just as good of a solution. I've, and I've heard the beer many times. Yep. Um, the other question that we have is last summer, I had squash bugs on my cucumbers. How can I get rid of them? So I have had the same problem. And it's interesting because one year I had no problem. The next year I did. And by crop rotation, moving my squash and cucumber to a different location, it solved my problem. So that sort of um, tends to the they can go dormant in the soil. But um, what I read was, and what I practiced, is in the morning you spray with a hose your, your uh, base of your plant. The squash bugs will come out and then you have to collect them. And that's the hard part. So you wanna, you wanna sort of drown them in the base of the plant where they're living. So they come out and I got a very long tweezers and I would just pick them off and put them in a container and throw them away. 
but it's not an easy task and they can actually destroy a plant pretty quickly if you don't take care of them. Tricia, I know you you probably have experience and have you had any? Same thing. No. I, I was actually addressing the hornworms because I spray them with soapy water and they start wiggling. Yep. Um, and I go, ooh, ooh, and I pick them off. And it's interesting because I have birds in my yard that I just toss them and the birds will run and jump and yep. get them. So I, I do, um, my neighbors laugh at me because I cleanse my soil, but I'll go through and um, I have a lot of uh, aspen trees, so the roots come up, but I'll go through my soil and the grubs will follow your aspen tree roots. And as I'm digging in the soil, the birds line up on the back slope on the rocks. And literally, I they're waiting for me to throw them. And so it's like, oh, another worm. And they fight over the grub worms or, you know, grubs that are coming out. So. Well, and when you're talking crop rotation, we always talk about each year notating what you plant where mm -hmm. and keeping historical records. And this is why we, we bring this up again and again is you don't always remember, especially if you've got a lot of places in your yard to plant, what you planted where. Um, but you do want to rotate through about a four planting cycle. And, and okay. note what pests you have in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, I did plant marigolds a year ago in, amongst some of my plants, and they seemed to love it so much they grew bigger than my plants and outgrew my vegetables. So, <laughs> so be aware of what you're planting as a companion plant. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody again. We look forward to seeing you all hopefully on our June 28th presentation. And have a wonderful evening and a great June. Good night, everybody. Bye.